Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangi reporting for the media speaks, and uh, something happened to me that never happens to me. I got a cold. Why? I quit drinking vitamin water and started drinking tea, and of course, within two weeks, I got sick. And uh, Those of you that know, I, I used to get sick all the time, started a vitamin regimen, and guess what? Never get sick at all. Friends, that's not why you tuned in. You're here for the news, and we have copious amounts of it. We're starting off here with some Charlie Hebdo news. I, I don't want to be one of these people that are rushing to call this a false flag event. I, I have a personal distaste for people that do that. I think you can you call things a false flag so often that when you really do have one, such as uh, 9-11 appears to be. If you call every act of terror a false flag, then you're hurting the cause, not helping it. With that having been said, the more I look into the Charlie Hebdo affair, um, it does have a lot of characteristics of a false flag event here, to quote um, this article at Prison Planet. It says, Usually Muslim terrorists are prepared to die in the attack, yet the two professionals who hit Charlie Hebdo were determined to escape and succeeded. Uh, that doesn't call false flag to me. So we're going to go by this point by point here. Craig Roberts wrote, uh, Paul Craig Roberts wrote it. We're going to go by point by point. The fact that they lived doesn't, uh, that they wanted to live. And not, not, not every, not everyone is a suicide bomber. Um, of course there are suicide bombers, but I think you can overstate that as well. But listen to this. Their identity was allegedly established by the claim that they conveniently left for the authorities their ID in the getaway car. Such a mistake is inconsistent with the professionalism of the attack and reminds me, he writes, of the undamaged passport found miraculously among the ruins of the two World Trade Center towers that served to establish the identity of the 911 hijackers. For those of you that don't know what I'm, world I'm talking about there, when the planes hit the Twin Towers, Out of the plane blew a passport, and it fell down through the skies, and they found it. Now, that's that's not impossible. Um, it, those of you that have studied air crash investigations of any kind know that uh, when a plane crashes, there are many instances where papers and that will be completely unburned, untouched, unsinged, and they are thrown from the plane. I get it. But it seemed a little bit convenient at the time, uh, especially that it would be uh, that somebody would go looking for it. I don't mean looking for it as in hoping to find that passport, but, you know, picking it up, reading it, taking it to the authorities, all that. Oh, yeah, that's who did it. Uh, I'd be interested to know, did they find anybody else's passports? It seems to me the two jetliners full of people should have passports. Um, if the scenario that I just laid out about the plane coming down and then expelling it in the um, rush of air from the explosion prior to the fire, because they are a split second apart for those of you that don't know. If that was the case, then you would assume that other passports would have also been found. I don't remember hearing of any. It says it is plausible inference that the ID left behind in the getaway car was the ID of the two Crouchy brothers, convenient patsies later killed by police for whom we will never hear anything now and not the ID of the professionals who attacked Charlie Hebdo. So he's saying that these people were uh, either patsies or they were set up uh, when they didn't even do it. Framed, I should say. <clears throat> An important fact that supports the inference is the report that the third suspect in the attack, Haim de Murad, the alleged driver of the getaway car, when seeing his name circulating on social media, was a suspect who realized the danger he was in and quickly turned himself into the police for protection against being murdered by security forces as a terrorist. In other words, he knew. He knew exactly what they were going to do. They were going to try to frame him for it. I hope he got a hold of his attorney. I hope he told everyone that he's not suicidal. Um, it says that he was a he has an ironclad alibi, and uh, it makes him the despoiler of the false flag attack. And it's interesting, because... 
It says the American and European media have ignored the fact that Murad turned himself in for protection of being killed as a terrorist and that he has an alibi. They, uh, the author Googled him and found on January 12th was the main U.S. and European media reporting that the third suspect had turned himself in. The reason for the surrender was left out of the reports. In other words, the fact that he could prove that he had nothing to do with it. Um, maybe this is one of the three they were trying to frame and he caught it before they could kill him like they did the other two. Again, I don't know. But I was immediately not thinking that this was a false flag and now I don't know. I, I'm, again, I'm not out here <clears throat> saying that I think it is. But they've got my ear. It says some media merely reported Murad's surrender in a headline with no coverage at all in the report that he said that he was innocent. It says another puzzle in the story remains unreported by the prostitute media, as he calls them, is the alleged suicide of a high-ranking member of the French judicial police who had an important role in the Charlie Hebdo, invest Hebdo investigation. For unknown reasons, Herlick Fredu, who uh, I, uh, is the reason that I said I hope that Murad had told everybody that he was not suicidal, he is a police official involved in the most important investigation of a lifetime. He decided to kill himself in his police office on January 7th or January 8th. Both dates have been reported by the foreign media. In the middle of the night while writing his report on his investigation. The Google research, as of 6 p.m. EST, January 13th, turns up no mainstream media U.S. report on this event. The alternative media reports it, as do some UK newspapers, but without suspicion or mention whether his report has disappeared. So we don't know where the report is that he was writing. Of course, they said that you know he he was he was going through depression and burnout. That's uh, the same explanations we always hear for mysterious deaths, like certain banksters. In my younger life, I'd gone through instances where, uh, you know, everybody when they're younger, you decide, you know, oh, is life worth living, whatever, whatever. A lot of times what causes that kind of depression in people is the fact that they don't, that they'll burn out, everything's the same. This was the biggest case that this guy would ever have. It is highly unlikely that he would commit suicide in his office while writing the report, which looks like it has now vanished. See, that, that's, that's one of the ways you, you can pick up false flags, for those of you that want to know the basis for how to, how to pick these up or at least entertain people. Like, there's people telling me that Fukushima was bombed. They're idiots, okay? You don't listen to BS like that. But when so many things don't add up, the, uh, the passport, the gentleman turning himself in, the other gentleman killing himself, it, it makes you wonder, people. So these are the facts as we know them. It doesn't make a lot of sense, the, art, the uh, author writes, for uh, Muslims to bring down hatred upon themselves by unifying the country against them. I disagree with him there. I think uh, Islamist extremists uh, really are that stupid. We're going to carry on with our extremists and our stupidity here. Mikhail Thalen wrote this. Anonymous hacked after linking CENTCOM hackers to Maryland. Hacking Anonymous is like slapping Bruce Lee. Okay, it is. It's like punching Mike Tyson. No matter how good that punch is, you are dealing with somebody who's about to bear. You don't hack Anonymous. Anonymous hacks you. It says, uh, it starts with an update. Anonymous has released the name of the hacker, thought to be involved with Monday's ISIS CENTCOM attack. Although some um, tech experts have questioned the validity of the page and the hacker's alleged link to ISIS, the anon message... Uh, Twitter account claims to have discovered a connection. And uh gentleman's name is Juniad Hussein, J U N A I D. His age is 20. Um is 6 months in jail for prior hacking. It says the alleged hacker appears to be the same jihadist who made headlines in 2014 after heading to Syria from Birmingham. Hussein was arrested in 2012 for hacking and posting personal information online from Tony Blair. In response to the discovery, Anonymous has released a statement. And it says, on a new operation targeting anyone involved in the cyber caliphate, which is Islamic uh, 
cybercrime for you Usher fans. Citizens of the world. Well, Usher fans are a little slow. Otherwise, they wouldn't listen to it. Citizens of the world. We are anonymous. In light of the recent cyber attacks, I'm not going to do that. Led by members of ISIS, we have extended our declaration, it says, of war to include any and all supporters of the terror group, including the cyber caliphate splinter group, who have recently been able to infiltrate one of the U.S. Central Command servers and leaked sensitive information that may likely be used by countries of terrorist origin like North Korea. Although we insist to maintain our distance from any support towards the actions of the U.S. government, we truly condemn any actions taken by those who associate themselves with ISIS and continue to wreak havoc across the internet. We are anonymous. We are legion. I don't like that legion thing because that's that's usually what demons say. But in any event, I do support anonymous in what they do from just about everything I've read. Um, what can you take away from this? Well, there are a few things you can take away from it. One <clears throat> is I like that. While they are willing to admit that the U.S. government does rotten things that they do not wish to be associated with, they do, in fact, point out that these secrets that were stolen could be used to help terrorist nations, because not everything that the U.S. government has in secret is bad. It says, the Anon message, Twitter account's profile picture and background was altered around 10.44 p.m. PST, Changed to feature the same Islamic State imagery, imagery previously seen on CENTCOM's Twitter and YouTube profiles. We shall strike like thunder. All allegiance to the Islamic State, a tweet on the account said. Yeah, and that's going to make people want to, uh, want to jump right over to you. Anonymous was able to reestablish control of the account in less than five minutes, discovering the exact location of the cyber caliphate hacker in the process. It says, nice try, a-hole. Now we know exactly where you are. Followers of the account immediately noted that the group's quick response time, pointing out that the fact that CENTCOM, the group responsible for the U.S. security interests in 20 nations, took several hours to appear back online. Uh, Anonymous did it in five minutes and tracked down who did it at the same time. Tell me once again how governments are better than the uh, private sector and the individual sector, because I'll tell you, I... I, for one, don't see it. Guys, this is more news on our wonderful friends. You know our friends. Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, many of the people that uh, were in the planes that hit us on 9-11 were of Saudi descent. Well, let's, let's hear what our friends, our, our good ally, Saudi Arabia, really does hear from Zero Hedge. A U.S. ally, Saudi Arabia, beheads 87 people in 2014, up over 10% from 2013. For what um, crimes such as drug smuggling, witchcraft, and sorcery. A Pakistani man convicted of smuggling a large amount of heroin has been decapitated by the sword in Saudi Arabia. The most severe penalties for the perpetrators are derived from the righteous approach of Sharia, Sharia law. That's why we tell people that follow Sharia law that you're idiots, you can go to hell. We are not following Sharia law. Am I clear? Wednesday's beheading adds to a surge of executions that began in August. Any execution is appalling, but executions for crimes such as drug smuggling or sorcery that result in no loss of life are a particularly egregious, says Sarah Lee Whitson of the Human Rights Watch. They, they stone and beat women for driving. They blame you if you were raped under Sharia law. Then you should have yelled. Sharia law is made up of a bunch of morons, and it's one of the things that are tarnishing uh, Islamists that really don't bother anybody. It's what's making us all sick of Islam. This is from Newsmax.com. Um, the last thing I'm going to do on my Islamic reporting here today, ex-New York PD detective, Muslim-only no-go zones could come to the U.S. Well, you know how you stop that? You go into their freaking no, uh, uh, no zone as a non-Muslim, and you crank obituary. You get yourself the new skinny puppy CD weapon. It's amazing. Yeah, blast it. Um, you go through there and you refuse. You tell them if they don't like it, then they can go the hell back to whatever hellhole it is they escaped from. If we allow this to happen here in the U.S., 
then we are far further down the stupidity trail than I thought we were. And I didn't think that that was possible. It says the rise of so-called no-go zone in France, and we see what that brought the French, segregated Muslim communities governed by local imams who should have to bite it, and abandoned by French police who should have to police it, are the handiwork of Islamists who plan to spread them throughout the non-Muslim West, former New York City police detective told Newsmax TV on Tuesday. I think this is actually a strategy that is slowly being implemented worldwide by radical Islam, Harry Hauk, a private investigator and retired NYPD detective, told the Steve Malsberg show. Describing a process of gradual takeover that he said is key to the Islamist dream of world domination, dominion. And of course, that's all they've ever wanted. What they do is they imitate the free countries and then ask the politicians that are giving these free zones, these no-go zones, let them implement some type of Sharia law, said Hauk. That should be a flag to any politician, Hillary, Rand, Obama, and any government, U.S., France, Russia, that if anybody wants to immigrate to your country and then change your laws for the laws they want to follow, those people should be kicked out immediately. Scrutiny of France's walled-off Muslims communities have intensified after last week's terrorist attack and violence in Paris, where Islamist gunmen, all living in Paris, but apart from the secular culture and traditions, murdered 17 people in a three-day wave of violence. Like, uh, like Michael Savage said, uh, 17 more people killed in the, in the name of the religion of peace. So they're going to set up these walls, have Sharia law in them, and take care of everything themselves like they're their own damn country. The United States could be vulnerable to no-go zones as well because politicians will go along with what they can get them blocked to vote for. So if you've got, if you're a politician and you've got a block of people here that want this Sharia law BS, this Muslim rule BS to happen, separate from the laws that the rest of the country is uh, running under, they will allow it to happen so that they can get the votes from that section of people. So that is how these things creep in, and I'm reporting on it so that you can tell people, to hell with that idea, we're not doing it. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Three more stories to get to. I just very, very quickly want to thank Mike McLaughlin, who uh, has been a supporter of the show pretty much since day one. He's one of the reasons you get Dunce Cap Award printings every month. And guess what? He's a writer. Go check out his work. You can find his work, Mike McLaughlin. I'm looking at his page right here, M-C-L-A-U-G-H-L-I-N. And look him up. Get ready to be floored. Excellent poetry, ex excellent fiction writing, Mike McLaughlin. All right, guys, three more stories to get to. And they're all dumb. The only one dumb the other day, though. Did Jesus Really Exist by Rebecca Terrell? This has been sitting uh, since the 24th, but I've just, I haven't been able to not report on this. How stupid can someone be? Did the historical Jesus really exist? It's a ridiculous question, but one that inevitably comes up every year during the season celebrating his birth, which we just passed. The Washington Post ran a case in point last week with an article entitled, Did Historical Jesus Really Exist? The evidence doesn't add up. It was written by a bonehead, Raphael Letaster, the University of Sydney Religious Studies lecturer who questions Jesus' existence because the only historical accounts available today reference the clearly fictional Christ of the faith. Let me add that that is not true. Josephus, and I, you can find my work on this by going to uh, look up Sam DeGangi on Amazon um, through um, the the Amazon site, you'll find my book. It's called uh, Resurrection, the, Historicity, the, the Case for the Historicity of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ is the name of the piece. You can buy it on Amazon, Kindle House. I go through this ad nauseum. But in a nutshell, Josephus was a Jewish, not Christian, historian who wrote about not just the death of Jesus, but the factual resurrection thereof. He talks about over 500 people who saw Jesus walk after he died. Again, 
He was Jewish. So don't tell me it's you have to read the Bible. I actually proved that Christ rose from the dead in that piece that I told you to look up. I've actually proved it without using the Bible to do it. It says he bases his entire theory on the tired argument that unqualified biblical authors had an even even jealousic ulterior motive and that otherwise there were no existing eyewitness or contemporary accounts of Jesus. Well, that's entirely not true because all it did for the people that stood up for Christ was ruin their lives, get them crucified, in some instances upside down, and uh, otherwise usually almost all of the uh, original apostles and the first church people were stoned, beaten, persecuted against. So no, they did not have an evangelistic ulterior motive. It says, by rejecting the Gospels as reliable historical texts and ignoring 2,000 years of scholarship to the contrary, this bonehead conveniently removes the paramount record of Jesus. So basically, with no grasp of history whatsoever, this bonehead decides to ask if Jesus is real. And again, you can look up Josephus, you can look up so many different things. We have no more account of St. Paul's life than we do Jesus' Christ's life, said Dr. James Tabor, chairman of the Department of Religious Studies at the Uni of North Carolina at Charlotte. Our New Testament records, we have very little additional historic information about Paul. And again, you have to look to outside sources. The trouble is they don't want to admit what is obvious when you do this. And that is that the Bible stands up historically almost flawlessly. Look up the case for Christ. Look up the uh, case for faith. Look up the works of Hank Hanegraaff, if you doubt me. Two more things to get to. We don't normally do sports on this show, but don't zone out. This is uh, this needed to be reported on. NFL facing accusations of fixing the Cowboys-Packers game. I watched the game, and I agree. My best friend Dan was rooting for Green Bay, and he agrees. The man clearly had a fair catch that he was in control of. So why does it matter? Maybe you hate sports and you're like, Sam, why the hell am I listening to this? I'm going to turn off and go listen to Kesha. No. Um, you see, it matters because there's a lot of money tied up in this. It's not illegal for the NFL to fix its own games. Repeat, not illegal any more than it is for the WWE to do so, which they do. Kit Daniels, Infowars.com. There are some shenanigans going on here. When I'm done reading this, go ahead and look up the play. It says, the Dallas Cowboys lost in Sunday's NFL playoff game is raising accusations that the game was rigged to ensure millions of gambling profits, which can be easily dwarf that of television revenue and ticket sales. And again, I, I watched the game. I watched the play repeatedly. I agree there's something fishy going on here. It says, in the fourth, qu fourth quarter of the Cowboys-Packers game, Cowboys receiver Des Bryant made a huge catch on a fourth and two, which means for you that don't know football, if they don't make it, they're not going to get, they don't have another try. They're going to lose the ball. Normally it's kicked. It was moving the Cowboys near the goal line, but the referees overturned the play after initially calling it a catch. Why did the refs overturn the play? Was it to ensure a different outcome of the game? It was clearly a fair catch that he had control of, so yes, I think so. It should at least be looked at. An organization can make untold millions in gambling profits by simply paying off the refs to fix games with bad calls. Uh, again, look at uh, look at how San Fran lost its uh, its place in the playoffs due to being cheated. San Fran is another game I watched. Obvious cheating, clear referee cheating. It says some fans suggested the game isn't rigged because the Cowboys benefited from a bad call when they played the Detroit Lions on January 4th. But they don't realize that gambling profits are made not through rabid team loyalty, but rather the outcome of a particular game. So it doesn't really matter if the Cowboys win one week and lose the next as far as bets are concerned. Go look at the play, guys. I think it was rigged. Or at least I would uh, I'd be very surprised if most people listening to my voice didn't also agree. Uh, that brings us to the dum de dum de dum de of the day. The NFL should have gotten it, but no, there's an even dumber one. WCSH.6.com Police arrest nine-year-old after he misses court on a gum charge. Gum, not gun. Gum. 
Prosecutors in Post Falls, Idaho, had police arrest a nine-year-old boy who failed to appear in court to answer charges that he stole a pack of gum. Kootenay County Prosecutor Barry McHugh said he now regrets that his office sought the arrest warrant. The boy was arrested and released January 9th. After reviewing the file today, I have concluded that my office's request to have an arrest issue warrant issued was a mistake under the circumstances, McHugh said. Referring to a statement his office issued Monday, I regret this having taken place and will do everything in my power to avoid this type of mistake in the future. In the interview, he said prosecutors sought the warrant because they had missed the boy had missed two prior court appearances. And I think the way the law is written, if you miss two court appearances, they automatically issue an arrest warrant. Post Falls Police Chief Scott Howard said the boy was accused of taking a pack of gum this summer. He said his officers were legally obligated to arrest the boy, who was taken to the juvenile detention center in nearby Cora d'Aline for processing. Okay, you arrested him. That's fine. Teach the boy a lesson. I'm not going to freak out there. You could have scared him a little more and maybe not arrested him, but okay. You know, they write these laws these way, and we vote for them like idiots. He was not handcuffed. He was not searched. He was not put into jail. They basically just gave him a ride, Hogg said. Not that that, make, not that doesn't make it right. He added, when the warrant was issued, it was shocking to our staff. I've never seen that happen before. I think that this case just slipped through the cracks. Why isn't he getting the dumb of the day? Because the prosecutor and the cops have basically admitted that they were dumb. We, we we do the dunce caps. We do the, we do them to, to prove a point. We do the dumb day of the day to prove a point. But if the point is proven, then we don't kick someone when they're down. He admitted he was wrong, so he got the dumb day of the day, and not the dunce cap of the month, which he was going to get. He was so going to get it. McHugh, an elected prosecutor, said his office had unsuccessfully tried to enroll the boy and his parents in court diversion program. In the statement, McHugh said his office should have been requested to court order of a child protective investigation. P.S. They should not be allowed to force you into anything whatsoever. It's America. You pay your penalty and you move on. They should not be allowed to force anyone into anything, and that includes the DUI racket. Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Sam I.B. DeGangie signing off, asking you to go to TheMediaSpeaks.com. Look up the work of Kyle Court D. Lake and myself. We are posting all the time. You can also donate to the show. Every penny that you give to me, I put it towards a better show. More often posting, even posting when I'm sick. Uh, lastly, friends, if you're looking at my finger here, you are the low def over here. If you're going to share my video, share that one. That's the high def one. The, uh, the low def is for my live listeners. Good night, friends. God bless. And as always, thanks for listening.